it definitely. Now, Joe Brady, you're you. I've seen pictures of you. You're you're you can't possibly be the same Joe Brady who, after 33 years, retired from the New York City, um, what police department, I think, and marched with bagpipers in the front of a parade. Well, Joe Brady Jr. did a lot of great things and continues to do great things in the piping community. I think he taught FDNY and or NYPD throughout his piping tenure. So no relation. Uh, I, I know I knew Joe Brady Sr., his father. Interesting story about how I met him. Uh, but I also knew Joe, I know Joe Brady Jr. But no, no but relation. Neither of those is you. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm the Joe Brady from Chicago. <laughs> So if anybody's looking for Joe Brady bagpipes in their Google searches, we got to make sure we're getting the right Joe Brady here. Fair enough. But, but you know, J Joe and I are friends, and uh, we, we, we get each other's messages from time to time. Yeah. Did the three of you ever get together for drinks or something, the three Joe Bradys talk bagpipes? Not the three of us. So I was with Senior, Joe Brady Senior in Hawaii, mm. and uh, I was with uh, Joe Brady Jr. I bumped into him in a number of games over the years and had a beer with him up in uh, – Fair help. Uh, now, were you with him in Hawaii? Like, is this, are these connections, I, I, I'm not, I'm not sure. Tell me all about yourself, Joe Brady, because I, I can't tell. Are you involved directly with military service? Um, are you a policeman? What, what? Nope, I, I, I was the police. I was the police for almost 20 years, mm -hmm. uh, most of that time with the city of Chicago. So that's my background there. But uh, the Hawaii thing, uh, I got invited to be a guest player with a band called the Atlantic Watch Pipe Band. Mm. They're out of New Jersey. And uh, so they invited me and my wife, who's a tenor drummer, to come to Hawaii. This is 20 years ago now. Mm. And uh, I'm getting on the plane in Newark. And uh, the flight attendant goes, oh, oh, another Joe Brady. Your dad's on the plane already. And I'm like, I, I, just, <laughs> I thought she was just kidding with me, right? Yeah. No idea. And so I sit down on my plane, and we're about halfway over the, over the Pacific Ocean. And I hear a guy behind me singing Pebra. He's singing the tune. Yeah. I turn around and look, I go, what peep is that? He goes, are you a piper? And I go, yeah, I'm a piper. And he put his hand there. He goes, hi, I'm Joe Brady. And I looked, I go, oh my, oh my goodness, I'm Joe Brady. <laughs> Did you think for a second that possibly there was like a time continuum breakdown and you were seeing yourself oh. in the future? No, no, it wasn't episode of Lost or anything <laughs> like that. It was, uh, no, it was just, it was kind of neat. So we, uh, we headed off and, uh, yeah, he was coming just to hang out with the Atlantic Watch Pipe Band at the time. I think he'd been teaching them. So, oh. uh, Joe Brady Sr. was a judge, mostly a peep rock judge and kind of legendary, right? There's, there there's rumors that if he, if he saw a piper, he didn't like, he would turn his hearing aids off and just let him play. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but good people. Yeah. Were you over there for, was it a, a Pearl Harbor event or was it, um, just just something else just to go play in hawaii well this was really before all the pearl harbor events uh, started happening but we did play at pearl harbor we played on the uss missouri uh, we played throughout uh, downtown waikiki just and we were with the uh, there's a hawaiian pipe i think it's the pipes and drums of honolulu or the mm -hmm. pipes and drums of uh, I, uh oahu yeah there's pipers and drummers are on the island i think jack lee goes out there too so mm -hmm. just a uh, neat neat place to play the bagpipes yeah yeah well, um, take me back even further. Uh, I guess I usually don't ask anybody about pizza until the end, but I, where you're from, Chicago, do you have strong feelings about pizza and how it ought to be taken care of? I it mean, it's not done? strong. It's it's not strong feelings. I mean, it, it, taste is like tone. It's personal, right? Mm. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I, if I'm going to send somebody to a pizza place in Chicago, it's going to be Lou Malnati's. No and place else. Taking, taking note uh, here for when I go to Chicago. Yeah, I, I mean, and that's for, you know, if you want the stuffed pizza. Um, they also have a fantastic pizza that the crust is actually made out of sausage. Okay, that's where I want to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Lou Malnati's. And then there's another great, if you like thin crust, there's a place called uh, Aurelio's. But Aurelio's, every oven is different, so there's only a couple of good ones out there. So, oh, I mean, it's it's, pers it's just personal. Yeah. It's personal. Mm -hmm. That's one thing I miss about Chicago. I miss the food. Did you grow up there? Yeah, yeah. Born and raised on the south side of Chicago. Tell me, tell me about that. Take me back. Tell me, tell me how how did Joe Brady get, get formed into what he is today? Uh, how many I, siblings I, uh, did you have? When did you you know when yeah. did you go to school? All that stuff. Tell me all about yourself. Sure. So, uh, like I said, grew up uh, Irish Catholic kid on the south side of Chicago. Uh, I have an older brother. I have, yeah, I have an older sister. And uh, you know, I jokingly like to say that uh, mom wanted a priest in the family. So, uh, I, you know, I, I went to Catholic grade school, I went to Catholic high school, went to seminary, uh, didn't work out for me. It wasn't what God wanted for me. 
and at, uh, try to tell your, you know, try to tell an Irish Catholic mother that. Yeah, right. At, at that uh, time but, and place was were were these Catholic schools going to be gender split, and so you would have been surrounded by only boys, or were there what what you know uh, what, what do you say? Co-ed? Yeah, it was like what, what, it was, was it? it was only boys. So yeah. it's funny, like and the woman I married, my my wife, she uh, I went to the all boys Catholic school. She went to the all girls Catholic school, and we met doing "Don't Laugh at Us" High School Musicals. <laughs> no, so we that's... needed girls; they needed boys. <laughs> in so many ways, that's my own experience with my own wife. We both went to public schools in predominantly Mormon places, but it was musicals for us as well. So I won't laugh at you yep. one bit. It, it uh, yeah, it's like an episode of Glee how we met. Uh, but uh, at <laughs> about nine, like, like this is the first girl you've ever met in your life, and you're also you're the first boy she's ever met, and you just fall in love right away. Well, not quite. She actually had a boyfriend who was a football player at a uh, at a high school there, and I didn't hey. like the way he treated her. So go you, all right. Yeah, yeah. Life worked out. Worked out well. Twenty nine years later, married, so we're doing okay. Uh, but you know, at, at nine, I, I started taking lessons with uh, the Stockyard Kilty Band in Chicago, wow, Southside Band, and uh, yeah, the and the guy that taught. Or... Oh God, by no means, mm. no, by no means at all, because uh, the guy that taught me, Dave McKee Senior, he is you know, a, I think six boys. Mm. Uh, two of them, two of them ended up as police officers. I ended up working with both of them with the city of Chicago. Uh, one, one's a piper, one's a drummer, both phenomenal musicians, but Dave, Dave taught, taught me how to play and, uh, just mean old Scottish guy, you know, yelling at us, hitting us, uh, he hit us with the chanter. I mean, I, I, I recall the top of my chanter was broken off because I'd been hit with it. Um, <laughs> you know, and you gotta, you gotta play with the nub, you gotta play your chanter with the nub of, of, of the, of the practice. Blow, blow, blow piece. Well, that's one way to get motivated, I guess, huh? Yeah, so off and on. Uh, I wish it would have been more on as a kid, but, I mean, you get distracted. You do other things growing up. Yeah. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't get really fully back into it until I got on the job as a cop. And uh, when I got back on the job as a, as a police officer, someone's like, hey, you played the bagpipes, didn't you? I'm like, yeah, you should join the Emerald Society. Uh, a bunch of drunk cops playing the bagpipes. Yeah. I joined. Whack um, with Chanders. <laughs> oh man hey listen their int- their intentions are right they're they're always they lead with their hearts the intentions are right but yeah. it's just it's yeah it, it's it is what it is had you when um, you were younger had you progressed to the point where you were playing pipes and going to parades and stuff like that and so hopping back in wasn't that crazy or had you not got quite that far so there was a lot of work to do still when you hopped back in no there wasn't a lot of work. I, I was able to hop right back in i mean all through high school all through grade school and high school i played the trumpet too so i mean musically the foundation was there yeah. um you know, the mechanics of it, geez, I remember the first bag that Dave tied into my bagpipes, it was an L&M uh, hide bag, and he mm. tied it in backwards like I was a lefty. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a nightmare, right? Oh, yeah, I tied it in wrong. Just play it that way. Just play it that way. What? what? Did you put it on the wrong shoulder, or did you just lean no, everything I, I against put it, your neck? I leaned everything against my neck. It was just, it was crazy, wow, right? And really? just play it, and, you know, no seasoning. Like, Dave, I can't blow this. This reads hard. Just blow. You know, what does that even mean? Just blow. What, what does that mean? Uh, blow harder. You're not blowing hard enough. It's oh, it's mind boggling. Man, uh, if I ever yeah. feel bad about my shortcomings as a teacher, I'm just going to remember this story. <laughs> oh, but it's, it, uh, my story is not alone there. I mean, there's, there's teachers like that, that that's just how they were. Blow. Yeah. You tie it in backwards and, you know, no, no drone <laughs> read in one of the pipes everywhere. and yeah, just leaking air everywhere. How do you do this? It's like, are you trying to get me to quit? Oh, man. So. Well, if you make it through that, I guess you you know you you really can do it, huh? Yeah. Well, I'm doing it, so I'm I'm still doing it, not just marking time doing it. So. Yeah. So then, at what point does you you, you join the Emerald Society? I, I feel like, what's up with Wake and District? Did you establish that band? Did you come into it from the Emerald Society? You you seem like you. I, I get the the impression that you're a big deal over there. <laughs> yeah. Th- thanks to the Chanterant, uh, uh fellas yeah talk uh, about that so, too how, how the heck did that happen because i know right, well, that's the thing joe i feel like like you and i are talking for the first time today but i feel like i've known you for years because of listening to the channel rant. i've heard your own voice of course there but i also hear you referenced so often of course I, what i think in my head immediately is f you joe brady yeah oh yeah yeah do, and do you know why that is I know. Well, I mean, ep- I've listened to every episode of the Channel Rant, so I feel like I should know. But what a blur, you know? Like I don't remember. Was it? Well, so I appreciate them making me famous. I love it. But it's like every time they wanted to do something in piping, or hey, we should try this, and they're like, "Oh, Joe Brady already did it." F uh, him. Yeah. Right. So it's always been <laughs> F you, Joe Brady, because uh, 
when they come up with ideas. I'm not saying I invented the ideas, but yeah. I've tried a lot. It, you got to find what works for best for you and your band. So I've, right. I've tried a lot of things and we're fairly public about it too on social media and letting people know what works and doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, but, but just oh. for his department, Joe, did, did I, lose you? I am so sorry. I'm afraid that I lost you for like the last two minutes. Oh no. Yeah. I am really sorry. Okay. Man. It's okay. Where'd we lose off? Um, you had just finished telling me why the Channer Ramp boys were saying F you Joe Brady. Okay. So we, we did finish that part. Yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll circle back to, uh, uh, from Chicago to North Carolina. And That's I think fun. I know what happened. My, my iPad went on silent mode here. So cl- clap again. I apologize. <laughs> no sweat, man. I'm going to give us a three, two, one. Here we go. Three, okay. two, one. We're good. So, uh, yeah, carry on irregardless. Um, I played off and on with the Emerald Society and the Chicago Police Band uh, in Illinois. Did a lot of great things. Uh, played Carnegie Hall. Oh, awesome. Uh, played, yeah, played in Ground Zero after uh, mm-hmm. the events of 9-11. Yeah. Uh, played in Monaco for the International Association of, of Police in front of the palace, which is really cool. Yeah, uh, wow. Uh, got to do just, uh, you know, being a cop in the, the second largest police department in the nation opened up a lot of doors to be able to go play events. We yeah. didn't play well, but... We we were adequate, I guess you could say. Was uh, this, but good people in those. Was it was it ahead, one of those Jeff, situations sorry. where, um, like bagpipe time could be duty time, and so it was attractive for a lot of cops to join the pipe band in that way. Yeah, in in Chicago, well, not necessarily attractive, but at least the bosses rewarded us. We called it Code Forty Nine. That mm-hmm. was a, a payroll code that mm-hmm. we were going sent to go do bagpipe things. So yeah, I was Code Forty Nine mm-hmm. all the time. It, it did get to a point, like if my boss wanted me to play something, you know, and I, I got a bagpipe where he works for me. So I'd go play events for that boss. Uh, yeah. uh, but it, it, it did get to a point where it was like, I, I need you in the office or I need you on the street. Yeah. So it happens. Uh, but in 2005, my wife got a job offer here in North Carolina where I'm at today. Yeah. And uh, I'll, I'll take a, a circle back to 1999 where I was in Washington, D.C. at the National Police Memorial and I'm in my, my kilt with the city of Chicago stuff and have my bagpipes. And I see a small group of uh, uh, Southerners mm-hmm. holding court at a bar in a hotel. And they're drinking and having a great time. And there are these gorgeous black and gray uniforms. And uh, Chief of Police, uh, Gary Ragland, gives me his card. And we're talking back and forth. He goes, well, if you ever, if you ever come to North Carolina, call me. Mm-hmm. I'd love to have a bagpiper in, in, in my, my agency. So, uh, yeah, wife gets the job offer. I call him. <laughs> Basically hires me over the phone. Uh, we go down there, we visit, and uh, I'm playing bagpipes in the police department. And I had no intentions, James, of starting a bagpipe here in North Carolina. I figure yeah. I'll join the police department here, play the bagpipes to these guys for their honor guard, do my thing. And uh, by chance in 2006, I got asked to join the Charlotte Fire Department Pipe Band. Mm-hmm. Really smart looking group of uh, pipers and drummers. They wear these bright red tunics. Uh, to join them at the North Carolina Fallen Firefighters Memorial that had just been established there in 2006. So we're, we're all in full military dress. It's 90 degrees outside. We're marching down the street. and We do this thing. And I end up at Raleigh Fire Station number one and bumped into three guys, uh, three firefighters. And they said, hey, uh, hey, man, <laughs> as Southerners you can be, yeah. hey, man, yeah. uh, we want to start a pipe in. Will you teach us? Huh. And that was the beginning of my end. <laughs> that's how it started, huh? <laughs> yeah, that's how it started. And, and what's crazy is those three guys founding members they're still in the band oh really yeah i played a gig with one of them yesterday he's our bass drummer uh, he's our drum major but he's also a bass drummer so the, um, just kind of cool then where it might be that i'm ignorant of geography there so maybe it's obvious and you know to anybody who knows north Car- the, the the carolina as well but uh where does the wake and district name come from ah good question because i didn't come up with the name so uh the name was was established by the bands he called himself the band master is, is the title he gave himself and that's it's actually no it's a great title because that's also the title i think of the manager of the nypd pipe band so mm. for years brian brian coglin was the band master there and i band master uh brian's super super great guy great piper too uh but so skip called himself the band master skip kirkwood he was the chief of the wake ems uh public safety unit and wake mm. is the capital county here Mm. So, uh, uh, you know, he went on a, uh, a Scottish, you know, in Scotland, it's in Brewery and District. It's right yeah. wherever in district, you know, instead of counties. So Skip went with uh, Wake for Wake County. 
and district because I was from Johnson County and we had other people from other counties surrounding Wake County. So that's, that's where the name came up, right? The Wake and District Public Safety Pipes and Drums. Yeah, gotcha. That's that's our, it's a, it's our a mouthful. local band over here in Utah. Um, that was the same idea for their naming convention of Wasatch and District. The Wasatch yep. Front and it's the area, but it sounds more Scottish to say District. So we'll say. Yeah, Wasatch. it does. It, it Yeah, it, it certainly does. So I didn't disagree with it. But again, I, I again, I had no intention of starting pipe band number one, Yeah, <laughs> let alone right. naming it, picking uniforms. I'm like, okay, fine. I'll teach people. We'll learn how to play. And my wife had played tenor. Oh, so she, already uh, she was part of it too. Point. Yeah, she put, yeah. Well, I, and, and once we got married, she joined the stockyards with me and she played the tenor in the stockyards. Gotcha. Gotcha. And do you feel like, and, and this is just, just curiosity, of course, um, it's a, uh, not a value judgment because some people like bagpipes and some people don't, but do you feel like um, it's something that she did and does for the sake of hanging out with you or do, is she like super into tenor drumming as, of its own? She is, uh, the, so the tenor drummers in our band refer to as the OG sass because <laughs> nice. our tenor drivers call themselves the sass pack. <laughs> and uh, she, she kind of loves that. She's not one of those, uh, and I'm not. I'm not. I don't want to brand any of these really intense tenor drummers out there because there's just really intense people in every walk of life. Yeah. She loves the music. She loves being with me and doing it. She loves putting the kilt on and uh, going out and playing in front of people. She loves teaching too. So she yeah. taught all of our our first kind of passive tenor drummers. Mm -hmm. um, it did get to a point though where the tenor drummers that joined the band became better than her, and then mm -hmm. she kind of stepped back, which is that's cool. Uh, yeah. I'm in a similar position right now with the band that there's so many great players in the circle that uh, I, I'm standing back just a bit in awe. Like, mm. This is cool. We yeah. did this. But uh, yeah, so yeah, I mean, she still hangs out with the group and still teaches and, and things like that. Well, it is really cool. I see that um, you guys are shooting to send your grade three band to Scotland next year. Sure are. Yeah, that's the intent. How does that feel to kind of, I mean, like it hasn't happened yet, right? So like, don't don't stop pushing momentum or anything like that, right? But like sitting well, here, I, I, I can imagine that like, viewing the timeline in your own head from that chance encounter you know we want to play bagpipes will you teach us up to having a band at worlds <laughs> that's a that's kind of not a lot of people see that in one lifetime you know that's pretty cool and I'll, I'll circle back to the beginning so when we first started I, again had no intentions of starting a bagpipe band here in, in the raleigh area none mm. uh when we did start it the intent was to be a public safety band and uh, it, it turned into competition. You know, we went out in 2007 and did our first competition at Loch Norman. And uh, never forget Sandy Jones, who's a legend out here, greeted us, you know, at the line. And he was our judge and just said, you know, thank you for being here. We're so glad to see a new band out here. And here we were out there in these black shirts, black ties, black socks. This was before anybody was wearing all black, right? And we're out there in all black, checkered Glen Gary. So like, who are these yeah, guys? Is this the NASCAR a, pipe a, band? Yeah, you got a, you got a, you got a pretty, uh, pretty rock and roll look for a pipe band. And, and again, not not me. It's, I'm surrounded by people who say, hey, can we do this? Uh, there's only one uniform item, James, that will, uh, as long as I'm in the band, it, it's going to stay. It's the Checkered Glen Garys, because uh, that's my nod to the city of Chicago Police Force, because well, that's what we I, want. It's, it's part of your, like, your, like, I love your sort of, like, minimalistic design um, approach to, like, social media posts and stuff like that, and that the checkers come into that. So I feel like... As, as an outsider looking in, I feel like that's distinctive and it's classy and you ought to keep it because I definitely associate that with, with Wake and District at this point. Yeah, we worked with a great branding guy here in, in, uh, in Johnson County. Vast is their name, V-A-S-T. Uh, so Joel's just super, super smart guy and everything is minimal, minimalistic. Everything yeah. is that he does. That's and I classy. like that style design. Yeah, it's easy because you know what? It's easy to embroider on a shirt. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's totally. easy. Yeah. <laughs> it's, that, and that's why I said. I want something easy to embroider on a shirt. But yeah, we worked with him. So it's it's become a little bit iconic. The FOF is what a lot of people call the logo, mm. the FOF. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the logo, it, the logo, it makes up the letters FOF. Yeah, and that's the yeah, band's yeah. model for our fallen, for our fallen. Oh, okay. And then you have the check, checkerboard in the center. And it's a shield too. So kind of all that kind of right. plays together. Yeah, and Joel me, did a great job. The For Our Fallen thing, does that have to do with your mission statement as a band? Yeah, first and foremost, that's what we do, play For Our Fallen. And, and so what does that end up looking like sort of on a day-to-day -day basis? Is it um, a lot of uh, like no-charge funerals or memorial services? So just putting this out there, we would never, ever charge for a land of duty funeral, mm -hmm. ever. And uh, that's actually a rumor that's circulated right now because we just lost a deputy last week, and we weren't asked to play. We never solicit. 
Uh, we'll never contact the family or the agency. Agencies know how to get a hold of us because we play a lot of events. We play graduations. We play uh, promotions. We played a Durham Fire Department promotion yesterday with a small group. So we don't charge for those things. That's our mission first and foremost. But it's funny, just going back to our first competition at Loch Norman, when, when Sandy greeted us, I remember other bands there, other like competition bands going, well, they're just a, they're a public safety band. They're a fire band. Right. Those are people are telling us, oh, you're just a fire band. Just, yeah, we, that's, the, that's the key word, right? You're just a public safety band, just a fire well, band. Well, think back 15 years ago of what the fire bands look like and uh, what yeah. the competition kind of circuit looked like. It was different. Very it just, different, it, it yeah. was, in, in North America, it was different. So uh, we went out there, we won, James, we won in grade five. Quick yeah. March medley, we won and got to march off the field. And uh, quickly it shifted from, well, you guys are a fire band to the fire bands telling us, well, you're a competition band. Mm. Oh, <laughs> it's like, I can't win. Yeah. <laughs> right. And uh, just from there, we kept doing what we do. I, my personal feeling is we compete because it makes us better, makes yeah. us better players. And uh, we can get it wrong. And people will argue this with me, but people can get it wrong in a competition circle or on a parade. We, we cannot get it wrong at a funeral. Mm. Can't. Uh, that That's we speak for the for the family through music. We don't say a word, but we play music, and we can't get it wrong. And I've seen bands and players get it wrong so many times. Yeah. And you know, J John McCain. <laughs> oh yes. Right? Yeah. I mean, we, we go all, through the litany. Everybody yeah. hearing that, I think I suspect everybody listening right now just removed their hand from their face because it just immediately and, and so, palm I, goes. There. I I hate what happened for that Piper. I do. Yeah. Uh, and it's it it it, it happens. But you, you can't get it wrong in moments like that. And I yeah. there's been a number of high profile events where I've been asked to play and I defer. I defer to a, a, a grade one piper saying, yeah. Do you want to play this? And even then they're like, I don't want to know. Because James, you can't get it wrong. In those yeah. moments, you can't get it wrong. No, I'll I'll tell you, Joe, I was late to a funeral one time. And it, and luckily, luckily it wasn't entirely my fault. Like I was actually there before I was supposed to be there, but the family had already arrived like way early. And uh, I felt so terrible. That's never going to happen again. That was, <laughs> they were very nice about it, especially considering the circumstances, but still it was, it was uh, mortifying. I still kind of get a little sick feeling in my stomach when I think about what it was like walking up to that. It, hey, it, it's, it's happened to all of us, uh, whether it's a, a flapper valve breaking and oh, you got to yeah. use your tongue to keep the, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, the bag inflated, right. Or a drone reed falling out or yeah. a tuning pin dropping. It happens. Yeah. All right. But, we it can't happen at a funeral. It yeah. just it can't you can't get it wrong. So you know that's why we compete because we know when the competitions are. We never know when a funeral is going to be. Yeah, that's and true. So uh, another another kind of yep another argument that kind of came up recently last week. Um, the uh, National Fallen Firefighter Association they always do their their uh, memorial in October and uh, the Friday before they're going to do a, a workshop a clinic to come out there and uh, fix everybody's bagpipes and check tape and all those things. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a great idea, but I think that the day before the memorial, it's the wrong time. Mm -hmm. I, I applaud them for the effort, but it's, it's too late. Like yeah. tell that person not to play. You know, if you're rereading everything and retaping and rehamping, it's too late. Yeah. I appreciate you know, what's in your heart, but it's too late. And that's, that's why we compete, right? Because we know when the competitions are, we plan for them and it, it keeps us on our toes. It keeps our instruments where they need to be because we both know uh, the bagpipes. It's like trying to, to balance a, a marble on top of a hole in a snowstorm. It's impossible. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so what, uh, but, um... yeah. So, Oh, go ahead. Yeah, if there's anything else. No, go ahead, sir. I was just going to ask what the what the actual sort of like membership makeup looks like at present. Because I'm, I'm, is it is it a competition band? But you do need to be a public service person to join, or is it public facing no. as well? Like anybody could join. Anybody could join. Yeah. So uh, all walks of life. I think t today we have maybe one active public safety member in the band. Mm -hmm. uh, no correction, two. Uh, we have a lot of retired public safety, myself included, mm -hmm. uh, and then just people that uh, they want to do the right things for the right reasons. Like if someone calls up and they want to bag Piper at a funeral for a, a fallen police officer or a firefighter, these are people from the community that want to step up and do something for the community too. Yeah. Take yeah. time out of their day to volunteer and go do it. So a lot yeah. of kids too. Uh, kids are, it's an, it's an interesting dynamic with kids. So uh, we, we've afforded a lot of our kids that have come through the program because we're a 501c3 volunteer hours. And we had a, one young player there and she, she was off at Johns Hopkins now. 
And she, you know, she recorded over a thousand volunteer hours mm -hmm. and showed Johns Hopkins. They're like, what? Doing what? Mm -hmm. She was playing the bagpipes. It's like, nice. whoa, yeah. that's cool. Uh, but even, you know, I think of one of our young drummers, he's no longer young, he's off at university now, but you know, he got to meet the governor of North Carolina. Mm -hmm. he got to get his picture taken with the colonel from the highway patrol. Yeah. Just, it opens up cool doors. Like, it's cool for people. Yeah. Well, um, what else do you do in the bagpipe realm? Tell me more about, because uh, I know you got, you've got you got your fingers in a few different pies here. What else takes up your, your time in terms of bagpiping? Uh, so the big thing right now is partnering with Roddy McClellan of McClellan Bagpipes. So I, I met Roddy about 20 years ago and uh, ordered a set of pipes from 20 years ago and exactly. sold them since then. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wish I would have kept them, but... Uh, uh, but Roddy is based in North Carolina, in Matthews, North Carolina, which is out near Charlotte. So about three hours from me and, you know, go back and forth. Roddy's daughter's a piper, his other daughter's a drummer. And got the idea a couple of years ago, hey, Roddy, would you move to Raleigh? Mm -hmm. And he goes, well, you know, if, if, if the offer's right and we can get things going. And yeah, lo and behold, we played a gig in Zebulon. Uh, next door to a distillery we played a gig for a distillery and it was, it was a, it's a next door to, i didn't realize it was next door to a dis i've been watching the social media posts of the the shop being redone i didn't realize it was next oh yeah distillery. yeah so we can't yeah it's well yeah it's it's it's, it's next door to a distillery <laughs> that's and that's perfect. the distillery that we play that yeah so we've been playing at old raleigh since last year in march uh, we played for a, a bourbon release we've been playing every release since yeah just it's awesome hanging out there but uh, saw the building available and talked to the owner and said, hey, would you let us convert this to a bagpipe studio? Mm -hmm. Well, you better talk to the town of, of, of Zebulon. We talked to the town of Zebulon. Oh, man, they're head over heels for this thing. They think it's yeah. the coolest thing. It's one other town can say they have a bagpipe studio in their downtown quarter. I, I asked so, my uh, wife the other day, I was like, do you want to move? Because my, my little sister just bought a house in North Carolina. And I asked my wife, I was like, do you want to move to North Carolina too? There's this town called Zebulon. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So yeah, like, it, uh, it close to the workshop. Shoot, wouldn't that be awesome? Anytime you need anything, you just walk down the street instead of getting online. Yeah, <laughs> yeah here's the key: just walk in. There so, uh, yeah, just uh, talking to Roddy, and and really, Wake has played Roddy's channel. Roddy makes a Roddy makes a great bagpipe, but Roddy's bagpipe is tone personal to him. It mm -hmm. sounds the way he wants it to sound, right? Because he's the maker, and uh, and different woods. He uses the same bore every time, and uh, while all the profiles will look different. None of his profiles affect the sound of the instrument. Because the, so the inside stays the same? Is that part of correct. it? Correct. Yeah. yeah. All the measurements are the same on the inside. And uh, the measurements are based off a really old set of Hendersons that his father made. And uh, just even going through Hendersons and looking at them, no two Henderson bagpipes are really made the same because they had so many different makers in there turning stuff. Mm, and yeah. things got changed around over the years. So, but Roddy modeled the bores off of uh, his father's pipes. And that's the sound Roddy likes. I said it before, tone's personal. So that's the sound Roddy likes. But yeah. what does change is using the same bore with African Blackwood versus Coca Bola versus Mexican Ebony. Uh, right. Name of wood. It, it presents differently. And Roddy is a huge fan of Coca Bola because of the way it's warm. Mm -hmm. And that, that drone bore fills the room with sound. Is that, so, uh, is that bowling pin looking profile unique to Roddy? I feel like I've only ever seen it on his bagpipes. <laughs> So it, it is unique to him. There, there are some older bagpipes out there that have a similar kind of profile to them. Mm. But uh, so, so Roddy, just by nature, uh, not by nature, his training goes back. He's uh, traditionally trained in the Glasgow School of Arts. And he did jewelry for Tiffany's. Oh, really? And Roddy's, Roddy's style is natural movements, mm. just natural movements. I mean, just curves and... And uh, he showed me how he got that profile. It's a natural movement of your hand on the lathe. Just oh, a nat very natural movement of your hand on the lathe is what got that bowling pin style look. Mm. Um, it's just aesthetic. Some people don't. I don't like that. doesn't look traditional. doesn't look regimental. Mm. Roddy's not a fan of regimental. Too hard looking. Will he make a bagpipe like that for somebody? He's made a ton of bagpipes like that yeah. for people. So the, what he calls the traditional profile. Yeah. Oh, I, but yeah, it... Uh, one of my favorite things about that that uh, workshop remodel, just watching the photos go up on Instagram, was those door handles. Those oh, are so cool. <laughs> yeah, that's and that's uh, so that's Coca Bolo with brass, and he lined it with a brass rod. So I cannot wait to put that on the front door. Just can't wait because oh, every awesome. time you step in the shop, you're gonna you're gonna touch one of Roddy's bagpipes. Yeah, so, so cool. cool. 
so, so anybody just listening, it's little, little I'll, touches I'll, I'll put i'll put links to the to the uh waken district and mcclellan uh social media stuff down below not that they'd be hard to find of course but uh if you want to see some of these photos if you haven't seen them before i'll put links down below they're super fun to look at thank you thank you yeah, for sure but with us, uh, so working with Roddy, you know, Wake has played his chanter. Roddy made a great chanter, the Mac One chanter. So we played that for years, and uh, we weren't getting quite what we wanted out of the top hand from it, just yeah. uh, the punch. So we asked him to modify it, and it, begrudgingly, he didn't. No, there's nothing wrong with my chanter, <laughs> you know. And uh, you know, Roddy, we just want a bigger sound, right? Um, yeah. So we modified it, and we're going to continue to make small little tweaks to the elevation chanter series. It's yeah. interesting going through channers and what people like and tone people like. And I mean, James, we cut a lot of channers in half too, to see what was the voodoo. Right. Oh yeah. And, uh, yeah, we, uh, we made molds of the insides of other brand channers mm -hmm. to check to, to see what the, the bores look like inside those channers. And there's a lot of inconsistencies out there. I'm not going to name names, but there's a lot of channers that people praise that we checked the bores on them and we couldn't find two that were consistent mm -hmm. in terms of depth width. Yeah. This is modern and not modern. It, it, it is interesting, right? Like, I feel like there there are real differences that you can hear for reals, right? Because I, I know that I do hear something and go, I like that. You know, like there is something legitimate there. But I, I often wonder, like, how suggestible am I, you know? And I think part of this is because, not that it matters much, but I, like, I'm, I'm allergic to a lot of painkillers. And so since I was a kid, I've had to get pretty good at placeboing myself on purpose. You know, like I'll look at a glass of orange <laughs> juice and be like, this is going to cure my headache. I know it will. And then I drink <laughs> the orange juice and I'm just like, yes, I feel better now, you know? And <laughs> it does make me wonder a little bit, like to what degree, if I know that the set of pipes I'm listening to or the chanter I'm listening to or the drone reads I'm listening to are supposed to sound rich or supposed to be high quality, to what degree does that affect the way that I actually perceive those vibrations in the air. You know what I mean? I know exactly what you mean. And and how does that sound within your own sound umbrella where you're standing yeah, versus yeah. hearing somebody play your pipes from 15 feet away and go, wow, they sound good, but they don't sound like they do for me mm -hmm. because the sound waves are different around you. Yeah. Right. The tone is just projecting differently. Uh, or people saying, hey, I want the same setup Jack Lee has and they get it and they go, well, I don't sound like Jack Lee. Well, you're <laughs> yeah. not Jack Lee. I wish it worked that way. <laughs> but he blows tone differently. I mean, you could have a similar setup, but even drone reads, we found inconsistencies with the way drone reads respond in drones. Mm, yeah. It's just, it's just, it's very strange. Cause again, you're dealing with things that are made by human hand. Yeah. And, uh, uh I'm, I'm a huge fan of the, of the balanced tone drone reads, the red, white, and blue ones that, that Bruce makes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Roddy, Roddy doesn't like that. I don't like, the, I don't like the way the sound of my pipes, the bass sounds too, too thick. It sounds, mm. It's just too buzzy. Now I like a buzzy bass. I was going to say, that's, that's what I look for. I like the bass to buzz, but there you go. Right? See, he doesn't, he wants, he wants something warm and very room filling, mm. but he's like, well, if that's what you like, uh, but, but to, the, to your point with that sound, especially coming off the chanter, um, for me, it's hearing, it's hearing the way my F and my D and even my B, the, the, the minor chord notes come off the drums and hearing that vibration. It's like, Oh, that's cool. I got it. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Personal. It's all very, very personal. Yeah. Well, and I, I don't think that I have an especially um, an especially uh, uh, precise ear anyway, but I can tell you, and this is in no way a paid promotion or anything like that, but I have an Elevation Chanter, and where I live at Elevation, I just like having a high G that I can actually hear. So even just in simple terms, having having a top hand that actually makes a, enough noise to be heard is exciting. So I like that innovation. Well, that that that's cool, and that was one of the things that we wanted to uh, to tackle. And we worked with uh, you know Andrew and Josh. Uh, we gave them some chanters to test, and uh, we wanted to prove that 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 high G could be sustainable yeah. in North America at elevation. So we did it. Check the box. Uh, but again, when you start moving holes around, it impacts every other hole. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, there was a tendency for for us kind of here where the elevation isn't as high for that high A to be a little bit flat mm -hmm. to get that G in place. Yeah, so we're going to continue to kind of to refine it, um, whether we open it or move it up or down, uh, or even if we make the low G hole smaller. Because if mm -hmm. you look at that elevation channel, that low G hole is huge. Right. Yeah, and that was on purpose so that we can control it and see where tape was going to be consistent on it. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, but if you start closing up that low G or move it up or down, it affects every note on the channer and then you're chasing. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we don't want to go down the rope rabbit's hole. We, we figured we had a really good product that was consistent 
like even yesterday, and I shame on me, I hadn't picked up my McClellan bagpipes in a, in over a week, and picked them up, got to the Durham Fire Department. I mean, I knew they, I checked them before I went, but um, got there and everything was perfectly in tune. Drones locked right in. It's like channel locked right in. Didn't I moved one piece of tape? I moved a B. Yeah, that's a and, good and away I went. And you can just pull it down and play. That feels good. And it's consistent. It's the instrument being where it needed to be for me. Yeah. So, and we've been, it's funny, like Adrian, uh, Adrian Melvin, cause he made the reads for us. Um, I'll take screenshots of, you know, cold start five minutes in and screenshot of everything lining up except for my high A being flat. Mm. So uh, he's like, cool, we did it. And and that took almost two years to develop the right read for it. And it was all based off his band reads. So, yeah. but like Andy, Andy uses Gilmore reads in his, yeah. in, in Vegas. Cause Andy likes the, the kind of the flatness and a little bit thicker sound of the Gilmore tone is personal. So, right. No, since like in your what we like in your in your grown up years in your adult life, have you pursued more bagpipe education in a formal way, or has a lot of this been accumulating experience through talking to people, maybe at workshops and stuff, but also just through you know just doing it? it it's just doing it. It's organic and talking to other people, seeing what works and doesn't work. Mm. Uh, like what the, the stuff that Doogie's done, just amazing that he's documented so much yeah. of what works and what doesn't work. And he's, uh, up, his words, he's stolen a couple of things from me. Now he's giving me <laughs> credit for it. Doesn't call me after you, Joe Brady, but uh, Doogie has <laughs> a great nice? system in place. Uh, <laughs> When when yeah when Dookie calls you after you Joe Brady it's like oh god what what has life become <laughs> yeah uh, uh, but just it's watching the processes that work and maybe not necessarily what works for Scotland right, because what yeah. works for Scotland's different different for us here yeah and because I mean it's international instruments in their schools it's not like that here I mean it's a lot of adults later in life he's got a really cool program so you know his books uh, are a lot of things that I've learned over the years because he's learned the same things being yeah. a piper here but he is such a, a such a range uh, of knowledge. So yeah. just relying on people like him, uh, I learned a lot of what not to do. That's probably more important than anything else, James. Mm. I've learned from a lot of people over the years of don't do this. Yeah. Yeah. Have you um, any any um, any experiences of your own that stand out in your mind? I mean, maybe maybe to the tune of like a drone read falling out during a performance or something like that, but anything that's ever happened to you in practice or in a, in a competition or in a performance that you have thought to yourself, this will never happen again. I will not allow this to happen again. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, for sure. And I, I mentioned it before the, the flapper valve mm. on the uh, blow stick breaking it was a leather one, right? It was freezing cold outside, freezing cold. Yeah. And it just sat for just a little bit too long outside. It just cracked. Mm. So, uh, so uh found other, about. I used my tongue that day. I had no choice. Yeah. Um, and I was playing a really hard read. It sucked, oh, uh, but made it through. And then, then I bought a little Mac, I think at the time is what they were called. Yep. Yep. And then you find the moose valve and that's even better. Yes. Right. I'm so so uh, I'm, I'm settled into my moose valve for, for sure here. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had a, I had a, a bass drone fall down the pin. It just dropped because mm. I didn't have it tight enough. So that's why and before I go, like I'm, I'm going to go out this afternoon and play, I'm going to check my bagpipe end to end to make sure everything's tight before I go out there. Yeah. So it's yeah. just kind of the motions that you go through. Right. Checklist. You kind of get, you start to develop kind of a checklist, huh? Yeah. And, and there's people that have checklists out there to go through. You, you need to, you need to abide by them. Now, now speaking of things that we do when we're kind of like getting ready to play, I, I'm curious if you've given this any thought before, Joe, I was just chatting with my friend, Jeremy last night about the things we do with our chanters, like to check tuning when we first, like when we first strike in, you know, we, we have these little like runs like did it did it did it did it or like yeah like we all do we all run through something right and it's i think often the same thing every time or uh, some variation of it i I've, I've begun to wonder like are these like fingerprints like do, do each of us have one that's at least at least even on on a scale of like slight variation unique to ourselves what what do you think as a person who's been around in this uh you know with multiple bands and stuff like that do we all have our own warm-up scale uh, check thing uh, we do weird weird ones to check even a brand new read they put the chanter and play dump da 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 it's like what are you doing right yeah. so our our our, our warm-up routine is first you come to the circle with your chanter capped right mm -hmm. you got a you got a moisture control cap on there you cap your chanter you come to the circle we check everyone's moisture and this is i i still do this today just if i'm by myself you check it to make sure the right amount of moisture and humidity is on your chanter read uh, we take it out, we put it in together, uh, cap goes in the pocket, and we all just start playing. No runs, just start playing a tune, a tune, 
not a warm up exercise, not pinching the reed, not licking it like it's a lollipop, mm. uh, and just play a tune and just Pretty into your circle, tune, play, play your tune. And then as soon as you hear whoever's leading step in and start playing Castle Dangerous, we all come in together. Oh, I so hate everybody standing in a circle playing whatever they want until some correct, steps. but I see. Gotcha. playing playing tunes, not right. warm tunes up, not yeah, not not just, you know checking a high A or doing bump but that beat da da da. Right, it's just it's silly because you're not going to blow consistently that way. Mm, yeah, we also have the gauges on all of our bagpipes too. So the the gauge that Tad Myers designed is just it's wicked. It makes it, it's actually mortifying because it lets you know that you, you're terrible at blowing consistent <laughs> yeah, steady. I know that's that's why I don't um, like getting in front of those or the digital ones that just just listen to your sound and show you how much it wavers every time you blow in. <laughs> well, no one no one can blow perfect. Nobody can blow perfect. Nobody. Yeah. Um, but the, it just it, it paints a picture of where you need to be. But when you do those exercise, not I mean, when you do those weird warm up routines where you're playing notes, you, you people hear people are blowing all over the place. And the other thing that drives me bonkers is when people are warming up, they'll play a tune and they're walking around, but they're not marking around in step. They're not marking time. Mm -hmm. They're just randomly walking. So that's what our pipers we just have stand in a circle. They could turn around. They could turn sideways. They don't play against anybody else. They just play. Uh, we turn in. We all start playing Castle Dangerous. Nothing has to be said. So yeah, I don't I don't like those silly warm up things. Like even my own personal pipes. Yesterday I picked them up in Durham and uh, I started playing Castle Dangerous. Mm -hmm. You know, just get the get the pipes where they need to be, and in about five minutes they're right tunable where I need them. They're settled. Yeah, and away we go. Hello, friends. First of all, let me just give a quick apology to Danny P, who left the show a two star rating a little while ago because my audio is so often quieter than that of my guests. This is another episode where I've done all I can to level it out, but I doubt it will satisfy. On that note, feel free to leave the show a rating and or review on your favorite podcasting platforms. No obligation to give the coveted Quinta Astral rating, uh, but just saying, low ratings do kind of hide the show when folks are looking for bagpiping podcasts, while high ratings make it show up in their search results. So, you know, maybe leave a rating if you feel like leaving five stars and if you don't feel like you could bring yourself to leave five stars and just have a lot of constructive criticism for me maybe send me an email instead on that note you can email the show anytime at the droning on podcast at gmail.com you can follow the show on facebook just search droning on podcast or on instagram at droning.on.podcast and I promise that I will never be upset with anyone for patronizing the show over at patreon.com slash droningonpodcast. Direct links to all these things can be found in the show notes. You can also buy cool bagpipe and drum related shirts and such over at bagpipeswag.com. That's another way to support me and the show. And if you want to get some of your own band's merch up on there or your personal gigging merch uh, on Bagpipe Swag, just let me know. It's easy to set up and it's a great way to look really cool and pick up some passive income while you're at it. Thanks, friends. Back to the show with Joe. Joe, I usually would ask somebody what initially sparked their interest in bagpipes, but I, like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like you started it at such a young age and and under such abusive conditions that maybe you don't remember, or maybe there wasn't a spark of interest. It's just a thing that happened. But what I am curious about is that you you have expended a lot of energy on bagpipes over the course of your life, and I'm curious, you know, how did you not run out of interest or energy like what continues to spark your interest in bagpipes why do you keep doing this so i did run out of interest twice mm -hmm. twice in the last you know 15 years uh one of it happened right at the beginning of covid uh when it was first announced and the lockdowns went into place i got a spot for for two two weeks two weeks i didn't know what to do mm -hmm. like what do we do yeah what do we do we were all thinking what do we do uh got out of that real quick and then uh just this last year uh, leading up going to Chicago with our grade three band, I put the general band on break for mm -hmm. two months because I just, I was burnt out. I didn't have a spark. I wanted to get through Chicago and uh, do that and play. And we were victorious. It was fantastic. 14 ones across the board. It was a great day. And uh, I have since stepped back from the grade three, but my spark is actually kind of renewed uh, to the that's, band To That's really good to hear, Joe. I think that I think it's at least for me and that and I'm just going to go ahead and assume that it's good for a lot of us to hear because it's easy, of course, in all aspects of life for us to look at other people and think, well, why can't I do as well as them? Right. Or why can't I keep going like they are? Because, of course, what we see is when a person's turned on and 100 percent. Right. We, we, we don't we don't often get that. And but but internally we see when we are losing when we when we have not so we see other people when they're sparking if you will 
but we're also conscious of when we are not sparking ourselves personally and we compare those two things you know and, and that's fair to do and that's part of the reason we put up a lot of the, the quotes that we put up on mm -hmm. social media yeah. so people think that they, it might be for them and it speaks to them great not our intent but i'm glad it speaks to you and i'm glad you get something out of it but we put those up based on things that happen within our organization mm -hmm. things that happen to our members things that we see happening to us. So every, you can go through every quote that you'll find for us on Facebook or Twitter or wherever people put them up. Uh, and it's not just me. Like I see what happens to our band members and I'm like, geez, mm -hmm. you know, so we'll find a little quote to match up with that. Find a picture, not of that band member. We'll never marry yeah, up the band member that's associated with that <laughs> yeah. quote. Well, just, I mean, it's the optics, but, uh, but because I don't want them to feel bad, but for someone to say, Hey man, thanks for posting that. Or when they share it and said, yeah, we're going through this too. So whether it's the individual or the band. Yeah. Yeah, we're all going through it. This is—it's very real, and it's—it's it's not easy, <laughs> James. Yeah. It's you know, the, none of this is easy. We we pick the bagpipes and drums to play. What's wrong with us? We're mental. <laughs> yes, we, I think we all ask ourselves that question often, right? Why am I doing this? What is uh, what, going on? But I, and, and to, for me, and it just goes back to what Dave McKee, senior, my my instructor said: it's the greatest music in the world. It's the, just the greatest music. Mm. I love it. Yeah, it's yeah. the greatest instrument. It's so cool. It is. It speaks yeah. to us. Yeah, that's why we're here. That's well, and that makes sense because those quotes that you guys put on social media really do hit home. And it makes sense that, of course, they do because they're real, you know, like, of course, they're relatable because they're coming from real, real life. So, yeah, it's things that we hear and experience and then we share them. And again, I, I'm not alone with the social media stuff. There's a, I, I have a group of, you know, 70 people plus in the band that uh, they'll say, hey, did you see this? You know, you should share this. Yeah. So we do that. Yeah, it's just it's it's interesting. Um. Who usually, when you're not playing for gigs, when you're just like practicing or playing for yourself, who usually is your audience? Does anybody hear you or do you often go out alone? No, so I have, a, I have, a, I have an apartment above my garage. So it's just me in there mm. playing, tinkering with my instrument, you know, trying new reads, trying new drone reads, recording, hearing how it sounds. Yeah. I hate, I hate recording myself. But you do it anyway, huh? I do it anyway because, yeah, I, wanna, I need to know how it sounds. Yeah. Who do you think, um, and you, you can you can say anything you want here. I'm not going to double check it. Who do you think is your biggest fan? I, I think I, I know who my biggest haters are. Does that make <laughs> my fans? No, it's interesting. How many people like, oh, Joe Brady. They don't even know me, but like, he's an a-hole. <laughs> and they have no idea who I am. So are they my fans because they're following me? Maybe. <laughs> yeah. But uh, they're my haters. So, uh, um that's that's a really good question. My biggest fan, well, I, I my wife there, Aww. she's my biggest fan, and I'm her biggest fan. So, uh, but in the band, uh, in the pipe band scene, no, I don't, I don't, I don't see it that way. I just see a lot of haters, and to me, they're fans. <laughs> there you go. Because if they're watching, so, if they're watching, if they're watching me or my band uh, of what we're doing, right, wrong, or indifferent, and they're following us and hating on us, then they're our fans. Yeah. I love it. Very nice. Yeah. Now, we just finished up with Worlds as we're recording this, though there will be a little delay before it gets posted. But mm -hmm. uh, one of my buddies, Jim, who who supports the show, he, he suggested I ask a few questions. And these ones, I think, fit especially. I really want to put them to you. Uh, okay. First question. Do you think that grade one bands are too big? Size matters, right? Uh, that, that whole controversy. Okay, my answer is no, I don't. Mm. Um. It provides certain a different depth of sound. Here's what I will, what I will say that the the quality uh, of grade one bands today, it's awesome. It I is mean, right. all of those I mean, bands sounded just. I mean, even after all the nonsense of the lockdowns, and I think that's, sounded that's awesome. the thing, right? I thought this year they'd be coming out and I'd be able to tell a difference, but no. So it's here's a better question, though. Know, <laughs> right? Do we need grade zero bands now, or do we need professional? Mm. Yeah. level bands so it's yeah you know, and think think there's at least eight bands that would go into that professional category yeah and then uh, that, but that opens up opportunity for other bands that are also excellent to do well in grade one doesn't it exactly and not just be intimidated by it yeah. so uh, uh no i don't think they're too big now at the same time james we've gone to contests as my own band mm -hmm. that uh, the judges put on the score sheet could have used a little bit more depth Okay, I'm sorry. We only had two snare drummers out that day. What do you want me to do? We only had six pipers, right? Because even the ju the judges are human. They get used to seeing a big band and they're impressed by a big band. Of some course. of them are. Some of them see through it, right? And uh, the bigger band doesn't always hide things. Yeah. But some bands think a bigger band hides things, right? That they could hide a weaker piper, you know, between two strong ones, and 
you know, that's the contest. And I've seen it happen where a judge stands right behind that weak piper and just tears them apart. Mm-hmm. 18 pipers in the circle, they pick one. Is that yeah. fair? Eh, you know, I, I don't, me personally, I don't think size matter. It's certainly visually impressive and even from a sound perspective, but a big band could also just suck too. So, yeah. Yeah. True enough. Um, do you think that white hose are ever going to come back into fashion? Or have I love white hose. Do you? So when I saw that, when I saw the tribute band come out in white popcorn hose, I was like, yeah. "Oh, this is aw- This is awesome! <laughs> I love it." They were wearing jackets, and uh, I just thought it was the coolest thing. I love white hose, but uh, here in North Carolina, I would get white hose in a heartbeat. Would you? Uh, but in North Carolina, the games here they're typically muddy, and it's not your normal mud. It's the mm. red clay mud, and it's got that iron in it, and it just stains everything it touches. You'd have to. So we destroy new, them. Yeah, you have to buy new ones every time, huh? Yeah, and I mean, I have a couple of pairs of white socks. I love them, and we were going to do this. We did the Spirit of seventy six, but uh, the Spirit of seventy six socks, the original ones we had, were white. We were going to mm. go out uh, at a tattoo performance wearing white socks. Man, I love it. Got to do it. I, just speaking, no, just no yellow flashes. Speaking, oh, there you go. Yeah, make those cool. If you can, if you can play so well that you make yellow flashes cool, then that's that's really making it. Huh? I think I think RCMP does a good job of that. They were yellow flashes. Oh, I didn't even realize that. Yeah. Well, um, I speaking of placebo stuff, like I don't, I think that's probably what's going on here. But for me personally, I've always thought that the white hose are softer somehow. They're more comfortable. But that might just be because the popcorn thing looks nice and gentle. <laughs> it really comes down to the vendor that you get the socks from. Yeah, and most of the vendors today are getting the socks that are probably made in Pakistan, you know, the Piper's hose. Mm-hmm. Uh, we we deal with directly with a vendor, House of Cheviot. I'm probably saying it oh, wrong. Oh, yeah, I know that one. That's what, that's what our band we, is too. Yeah, we go directly to them. Yeah. And they're awesome to work with. And we it's just comfortable socks. But, mm-hmm. you know, the problem with socks is – you know, I don't like these. These are too t- tight on my, my calves. Mm. You know, these are too thin. These are my feet, right? So you got to find what works best for everybody. Yeah. But um, I like soft. I don't like, I, I mean, I grew up with the ones that were cable knit and they, they just shred the bottom of your feet like it's right. a, a cheese I always, shredder. I always double, shock, double sock with those. Wear some, some Nike socks or something on the inside. Then you need a bigger pair of ghillies too. So yeah, yeah. The rabbit hole. Do you ever feel like, um, competition tuning has gone too sharp and we need to recalibrate uh again let me i'll talk about the united states mm-hmm. in the united states all these bands playing and i'm not going to plug a brand but all these bands playing chanters and reeds that work very well in scotland mm-hmm. they don't work well here mm-hmm. especially when it gets hot out uh, and i i can say that firsthand because seven years ago when inverary and fife were here in the united states playing at the virginia international tattoo you know, they were creeping up to 492, 493, 494. Hmm. And I'm not going to say they were panicking, but they're like, geez, this is what you guys got to deal with, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And uh, they were playing different channers that you see all the bands that Scott playing those channer recommendations with. And uh, for them, they could probably sustain that tone. Even Field Marshall on the day in, in, uh, in, in Glasgow this past weekend, um, they were up near 490, if not just above, Yeah. right? But it's sustainable there because it's in Scotland. And they were all complaining about the heat because it was in the mid '80s. Yeah. Come on, man. Yeah. Come on, man. <laughs> uh, we know because it, it, you know here in North Carolina, 95, 100, you know, 100 degrees, 80 percent humidity. It's brutal, and the instrument is affected by it. So, me personally, uh, that's why we worked with Roddy because we wanted to bring the pitch down. Yeah. We- hey, I think I got you back. I see you. I don't hear you yet. Here we go. Did I lose you for a second? Did I lose you for a second there? Just, just for a second. Um, you're just saying that that's that's why you worked with Roddy to bring the pitch down. Correct. Yeah, and, and it it was for us because seeing bands here in North America uh, or bands in the mountains suffering from a weird top hand and high G and high A, mm-hmm. uh, we wanted something that worked for us because for I, James, hands down, what works in Scotland doesn't always work for us here. Mm-hmm. Seen it happen. So that's uh, yeah. Do I think pitch has gotten too high? Yes, in North America, it's not sustainable because we can't blow tone the way Field Marshal and Brewery can. Mm-hmm. So we can't play the same chanters and reads they're playing and expect to sound like them ever. What What would you think? Do you think it's even feasible to suggest making this a part of competition, maybe at a certain grade level where there would be a like some parameters set for like you you must be tuned within you know so many hertz and so many hertz. <laughs> And then if you're outside of that, then that's, that's a, that's a red mark on your, on your paper. You know, that's, that's I don't know. It's, 
you, you see bands that here, here's the double edged sword of this whole tuning thing. A band that goes out there and is really, really flat is probably going to have a nice thick sound mm. and very sustainable and play very, very well. They're going to sound good, but they're going to sound flat, mm-hmm. right? That's a to, to human ear. Human ear. They're going to sound flat. The next band goes out there. They're at 46. While well, that band sounds really bright. Yep. Bright. That's the word, isn't it? It's always so is it, is it, is it an illusion? Is it an audio illusion? Who played better? Right. Right. What's more sustainable? And yeah, we get in the mix of it because humans hear differently. Yeah. And uh, some people think that, uh, you know, a sharp channer is just shrilling and it sounds like a piccolo. But others Versus... would say it's bright. So exact, exact. Well, a, a bright channer can still sound like a piccolo. It could have a screaming high A or a screaming yeah. G. Yeah. Uh, so it just, it, I don't think we should put parameters on you need to tune, tune within this range. Uh, I certainly don't think we need to go down as far as, you know, Doogie proposed everyone going to be flat. I'd love that, but I, that gets I very complicated. Too, I want, I would love it for, for the sake of my, for my children's sake, if we went to be flat and if our written music actually matched the concert pitch as well, if everything was written in the key of B flat as well. Yeah. Tr- try explaining that to music professionals when you have to interact with them, right? Uh, exactly, uh, man. And and my yeah. kids who are going to piano lessons right now, I'm like, this is good that you're learning all this stuff. Get ready to throw it out the window when I teach you bagpipes, because it's just... no, don't don't throw it out the window. Keep it there. It's valuable. It's valuable but a half because well, at least it you can communicate. Stuff, but like bagpipes becomes, it's like I I feel like what happened to me as a kid is that bagpipes were like there's music, and then there's bagpipes. You know, because there were so many rules that didn't apply, right? So much of this stuff, oh, I'll apply this when I'm playing piano or trumpet or, or anything else, but not bagpipes. Bagpipes is Correct. Thing. It's its own mix, yeah. literally. Mixolodian, it's its own mix. Yeah, there you go, yep, yep. Yeah, it's it's certainly strange. And, the, you know, in interfacing with other musicians, uh, uh, yeah, no, most of the times they don't get it. And then when you explain it to them, and I'm fortunate, I have a couple of music teachers in my band. Mm-hmm. That uh, we just we send them to go talk to them, but uh, you know, going down to B flat, it's not just a matter of the channel and the reed; it's also the bag. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm sorry, the the instrument, the bagpipe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, you know, you could do the extenders uh, both at the tops and at the reeds, but that just creates instability. So you need a B flat instrument. The modern bagpipe wasn't designed to to do concert A. Yeah. So it wasn't designed for it. Can we do it? Yeah, and Rod has done it. We we can make a bagpipe like that. Other other makers have done that. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, Joe, do you, um, do you have any favorites, uh, any favorites to listen to, uh, individual pipers, trad groups, pipe bands? What do you like to put on rotation in the car? Oh, name it. I I have it in my car. I just, uh, I came across, uh, the Piper's Maker series. So a live album that was recorded. Uh, God, what was the fella's name? Uh, where they mix in non-traditional music with piping and drumming, and I'd flip I don't out know. my I'm phone. I'm but... right now. I didn't know about this. Yeah. Um... Oh, is it the Piper and the Maker? Piper and the Maker. That's it. That's gotcha. it. Incredible. And I think Big Rab was talking about it in the show. So uh, it, it it runs the gamut. I I think my my favorite pipe band recording of all time, Master Blasters, Vicky Police. Oh yeah, right. Absolutely. I, I know. that, so that just... album is burnt into my brain. <laughs> Mine too. You know, you just you hear like, holy a, cow. Like a track and a timestamp, and I think I would immediately know exactly what sound was happening at that time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm a big fan of Aurora. Uh, love oh, what yeah, they're yeah. doing. Love their music. Uh, when they when they got on stage with uh, with the power, oh, it's just so cool, right? I wish I yeah. could have been there. Uh, so, I mean, all these bands that keep coming up, Ross Ainsley's doing awesome, awesome things. Ross Miller's doing awesome things. Mm-hmm. It's just uh, the modern. And uh, we, have, we have a guy here that mixes like techno with bagpipes mm, a lot funny. of people don't like that I and mean, it's it's certainly fun it's different mm-hmm. uh it, it, james it runs the gamut i'll i'll, I'll listen to anything and go, oh, i like that that's kind of cool and then we share music internally in the band so like if somebody gets an album they're like hey check this out you should listen to this mm-hmm. and then you know 10 or 15 people buy the album so uh, we're always sharing music within the organization too mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. very cool well um what about most commonly requested tunes, Joe Brady. Is there something that you feel like is really popular that you're often asked to play? So, yeah, uh, we get asked a lot to play Cajun Grace. So, what do you do so that's, when that request? That's comes? amazing. That's amazing. That's amazing. Grace upbeat. You know what that is? And uh, we, you, James will. You do. We it. will never. We will <laughs> never play it again. We will <laughs> never play it again. And here, here's why: uh, is because we played it. I don't know. A couple of years after 9-11, we're in a bar playing it. 
and you know, playing Amazing Grace, Stoic, and all that stuff. Yeah. And uh, then we go, wee, da 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 ba da ba ba da da. It's fun. Yeah. We got done playing it. We had a jovial time. The place was crowded. Everybody, everybody was just having a good time. A, a firefighter from the city of New York Fire Department came up to me. He goes, that was the most disrespectful thing I've ever seen in my life. Hmm. He's your honor and dead fireman by doing that, that nonsense. And you know what? He's right. Yeah. I'll never do it again. I'll never do it again. So we get, we get requested to do it all the time. And I'm like, nope, not going to do it. Not going to do it. So typically now when we get requests, it's like, do you want something fun? Upbeat, march, or do you want something sad? Mm-hmm. Slow air, skyboat song, right? right, right, uh, right. Or So that, that's just kind of how we frame it. But yeah, Cajun Grace, I would say, is the one we get requested the most. And yeah, we'll never play it again. It's a hard no. Gotcha. 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 But I'm bump, but I'm bump. What do you, does anything take up your time and energy other than bagpipes right now? Do you have any other hobbies and interests or is this like, I have a real, I have a real job, James. I, you do? I work, <laughs> yeah, I work from, I work for Motorola solutions. So I have a real job. It's my second job now. So, uh, you know, did, did 20 years as the police and doing this thing for Motorola now. So yeah, I have a job. I travel a lot for work, but, um, yeah, pipe band is probably a, a big chunk of it. Uh, or or ancillary things to pipe in because now it's a bagpipe shop making bagpipes and chanters and right yeah yeah I think it all kind of weaves together even the even the bagpipes weave into Motorola because I got to play at uh, a Chiefs conference where I brought the bagpipe band out there and Motorola ended up interviewing me and putting another Motorola foundation and mm. kind of cool it all weaves together that to to be clear um I, I I happen to know because I work in telecom myself but. Motorola Solutions. It just for anybody listening, it's it's not necessarily your your smartphone. It's uh, more no, no, no. That's yeah, that's the Lenovo division that right. uh, that handles the phones. So they actually Lenovo owns the brand. Mm-hmm. They own the Batwing, the M logo. But we're right. uh, and most of what we do is uh, Land Mobile Radio, and mm-hmm. uh, I'm in a, a mobile video group, and uh, we do license plate recognition, facial recognition, all kinds of those fun Big Brother things. Right, right. So that, is... that keep people safe. <laughs> <laughs> he says loudly into the microphone. <laughs> the ministry of love is here to keep you safe. That's right. We keep you safe. <laughs> well, Joe, do you have, um, I feel like there, you've dropped some really good pieces of wisdom throughout here. And so we, I maybe have, maybe I've over pushed it because there would have been a, a lovely fade out moment, but what, how do we, do you have a fade out moment for me here? Something you can say for, for those listening as I fade us into drones. Sure. And you do the your... right things. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, take your time. I can cut out the silence, but then I just cut you off. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's all right. Here, we'll do the clap again. Yeah, just uh, do it what... to me again. I'll clean it up. When it comes to anything in bagpipes, pipe band, life, just do the right things for the right reasons. Lovely. As you're saying that, I'll have the drums fade in, and that'll be our finisher. Yep, that's it. That's kind of my mantra. I, I go by.